Hi, this is Karen Launchbaugh at the University of Idaho, and we're here again today to talk about integrated rangeland management. But now we're moving into a really interesting topic about how we might use animals in targeted grazing. And I'm here today with Mikey McDonald, and um, I am an under or a, sorry graduate yeah, student, already a grad student, <laughs> already a grad student for the uh, Natural Resources Program. Um, I've had quite a bit of interest in targeted grazing for a number of years now, and I was fortunate enough to be a conservation writer in Missoula, Montana for an important elk winter range uh, habitat. So. so Mike is going to tell us a little bit about her experience and what she knows about targeted grazing. So when we think about just grazing in general, um, usually the end products that we're most focused on, what producers are focused on, are the meat, the meat products, the wool products, the leather, stuff that they get from the animal to pay the bills and essentially, you know, keep that ranch going and um, and things like that. Yeah, that's what we've been doing for 10,000 years yes. since we domesticated animals. That's yeah. what we were focused on. So let's move into the actual book definition of, of targeted grazing. It's the application of a specific kind of livestock at a determined season, duration, and intensity to accomplish a defined vegetation or landscape goals. Um, there's two important knowledge areas of targeted grazing, and these are skills that are acquired over time um, just through practice and, and observation, mostly of landscape and livestock. Um, what managers need to realize is that understanding vegetation and its composition across that landscape and um, just that knowledge of managing livestock creates this really, really unique mesh of, of management that um, can be applicable uh, to a lot of different uh, ecosystems. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's again all the plants and the landscape and the animals. So there's an array of, of landscape goals that um, targeted grazing wants to, uh, you know, to commit could to, accomplish could accomplish. Bet, huh? mm -hmm. um, one of the most popular ones is the reduction of weeds on pastures and, and croplands. And what's interesting is historically, especially in, um, in 19th century France, um, I was doing a little bit of research, there was um, actually herds of sheep that were employed specifically for the um, grazing of the biomass that was left over from the previous season and for manure spreading. So these sheep weren't really focused on wool production or meat production. Their job was to eat the biomass and spread the nutrients. Um, another aspect of, of targeted grazing is to control the biomass that might be c competing with tree crops. So these can be pine tree uh, plants or orchards. Um, there is a sheep outfit uh, that follows the green through southern Idaho and actually stops along an apple orchard where they graze the understory so that those trees aren't competing with the undergrowth of weeds and grass and everything like that. Yeah, and we'll just go the next side. You're, you'll have a chance to look at that the Solons and and what they're doing out there because that's a pretty interesting uh, point of the way that they graze right. between those apple trees. Right, and. Another aspect is um, improving wildlife habitat. This is what I did on um, Mount Jumbo where we were targeted grazing invasive species to improve winter range for um, the elk population. And they actually saw an increase in this 10 year project and it's going on 11 now. So um, there's been real uh, population increase in those elk. Um, another way is to reduce uh, fire fuel load. Um, Another popular thing is for grazing fire breaks and usually employed with goats to graze all that um, fuel load that could possibly be, you know, uh, fuel for fire. Another aspect is managing uh, watershed char characteristics. Um, a lot of invasives can change watershed uh, pathways and so targeted grazing can be a part of, of managing that. And as far as wildland, wildland restoration goes, we have seen that in the past with implementing grazers to open up spaces or control a certain um, certain shrub, for example. Each fall after the lambs are shipped to market, the ewes trail from the mountaintops to the valley floor. By clearing this private orchard of unwanted plant cover and trampling the tunnels of mice and bulls, the sheep expose the root feeding rodents to birds of prey and other important predators. The ewes' activity makes them very interesting to these deer, and it makes rodent-controlling chemicals unnecessary. Well, there's a runway right there. It's kind of, you can see the sheep track where they've tromped in, and then some of the small apples there. We started grazing the orchards 
uh, a number of years ago now and went in at the request of orchard growers to remove that residue but also to um, the sheep will trample out those rodent burrows and so it's a good deal for them and it's a good deal for us. So when we look at targeted grazing, the paradigm is actually shifted to a different kind of product, and that is managing your plant communities and the plant species. Your frame of reference becomes shifted. Here we can see how targeted grazing can affect uh, the types of forbs and grasses that grow. Uh, through these, though these are native forbs on the left, um, you can see the impact of sheep grazing. Um, on the right, just a real good example of the possibilities that targeted grazing can lend to us. This is another example of that we'll get into later with uh, the specific species that you would like. So on the right side we have goats, on the left we have cattle grazing. You can see which animal has utilized what. There's more shrubs on the left and less on the right. Yep, and this is in Texas. Yes. This is actually a winter browse exclosure. So um, on the right was grazed by elk and on the left is an exclosure of riparian area. So you see the, the change of what grazing can actually shape as far as um, riparian yeah, areas. Yeah, so it's not just domestic animals. The wild animals have the same kinds of effects. And this was in Yellowstone, so yeah. that's an interesting effect. So what we first look at is how do livestock affect, affect weeds? It's a continuum. Livestock can either suppress or increase weeds depending on the type of control that is used within the grazing system. So we know that livestock create disturbance and usually our invasives like those disturbances. And so things like hound's tongue, especially is a good example for how livestock can transport some invasive uh, weed species. Um, they can also overutilize native plants, which reduces competition with the invasives. However, when livestock is controlled and managed correctly, it can actually stress those weed communities, reducing that biomass and the seed production, tipping the scales in the native plant community's favor. Yeah, exactly, tipping the scales. <laughs> so the difference is that continuum, um, improper use of grazing and just ignorant practices will increase the spread of weeds. But when you pay attention to you know, your controlled integrated system, um, those tools can really suppress those those weed species and yeah. revitalize your native plant community. Right, and that's the real art of this targeted grazing because it's the same animal that's doing both these things mm -hmm. and it really is just the skill of the manager to turn it from something that increases or decreases the weeds. Right, right. So these are just a few headlines um, from various papers showing public interest in um, targeted grazing. Only use stop forest fire is a particularly nice one for me because I've dealt with sheep a little bit. Um, zinc out of Carson City reducing reducing fuels. So there's a lot of elements for um, changing the grazing um, scale from a pretty broad sweeping tool to a really sharp, precise instrument that you can use to shape your, your landscape. Um, timing of grazing, type of herbivore you're grazing, and the defoliation level of the vegetation you're applying can all be used to you know, really hone in on your grazing treatment. This is an example out of Dubois, Idaho, um, with the hawksweed. The um, hawksbeard. Yeah. Hawksbeard. So on that yellow plant on the right-hand side here is taper tip hawksbeard or Crepus cuminata, and <laughs> in the spring it gets that really uh, yellow seed head, and so that's what's so obvious in this picture. So on the on the fall on the right, you can see that it was grazed um, in the fall by sheep, and on the left it was spring grazed. And as we know from plant dormancy, you're less, um, the plant is less susceptible when it's grazed in the dormancy. So you can see that they came back the next growing season. When they were more susceptible, they had a hard time regenerating. And I think also they utilized the shrubs a little bit more probably. You bet in, in, the, in the fall, there was less shrubs on mm -hmm. that side. Uh, just to point out, this was a 50-year grazing study. So this isn't something that happens overnight. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you graze every spring, the same season every year, you'll start to see these kinds of effects. Yeah. And, uh, and so this is a really obvious example of just the difference of just season of grazing. The stocking rate was the same and everything, just season yeah. of grazing. Yep. Yeah. So timing is very important. Um, we learned earlier that the palatability of plants happens usually when they're very young. When that green phase, those soluble carbohydrates are easily accessible. Once that plant starts to mature, the lignification and the structural carbohydrates increase, not as enticing to the animals as they would have been earlier. And also secondary compounds can increase as well. So once you're going through that curve, that level of susceptibility and palatability, you have to find those windows in which you can put your animals on 
to really have an impact on that plant community. Um, just finding those times is, a, is usually a challenge to land managers because you have such a diverse array of, of plants out on the rangeland. Yeah, it was easy. It would be easy if there was just one plant. You would find mm -hmm. the time when it was still palatable but susceptible. But what happens is you have a situation where there's lots of native plants out there. And lots of winter winter annuals like cheatgrass, which green up early. And actually, actually well, cheatgrass is a great example of, of something that greens up early and is palatable and is that susceptibility is early on and you can put your livestock on and take them off without interfering too much with those native plants, um, really uh, more susceptible times in their growing period. Yeah, right. You hit the cheatgrass in that first red bar, red bar there mm -hmm. where the cheatgrass is more susceptible than the perennials. And then the key is just to get off of the range. That's, that's where yeah. we run into trouble. Yeah. Make sure we get off before the natives become yes. susceptible. So there's usually four cards that you can play with managing and that's managing grazing when the weed is palatable and susceptible and also when your desired plant is either unpalatable or not susceptible so dormancy or very very early in the spring green up so going back to our tools um, we're going to talk about the type of herbivore selection that you would like and this not only is for your forage but also can play a key role in where you're grazing too um, and then we're going to talk about the intensity of defoliation that you are inflicting on that plant so the importance of selecting a grazer, um, we've learned that uh, cattle, while they can utilize shrubs, goats are probably just made more for shrubs. That's um, right. They're designed to do that. They're just yeah. designed to do that. And um, cattle will, are, are roughage feeders. They utilize grass more. Sheep are, are intermediate feeder, feeders. They, you know, they can utilize all three of our, our types of forage, but forbs is mainly their, their most, uh, their most selected forage yeah, type. Yeah, so this is why we often use, if you're doing targeted grazing, you'd, you'd start with goats often. Not that cows couldn't use shrubs, but goats are designed to do that. Mm -hmm. If we had forbs like leafy spurge and spotted apple, we'd, we'd probably think about a sheep. Right. And then if we had a fuels project where we had a bunch of dead grass, we might think about a cow or a horse. Perfect. So starting with the right animal. Yeah. So here's a study um, out of New Zealand with the gorse plant, which is this like spiny very prickly intense plant that's actually kind of introducing itself into the west coast so this study was done with a previously planted um, field of gorse and they took every treatment down to 20 centimeters in height and they introduced um, different types of grazers so we had a sheep only class a sheep and goats and a goats only class so we can just see from the data here that sheep while they did graze it for a while it was not as effective. It actually grew back more. Um, sheep and goats less grow up, still tapering off a little bit, but goats actually kept that that gorse not only at bay, but they significantly reduced it. They actually went back and measured plant density, and they saw a, a significant reduction in the plant density in the goat only. Um, yeah, that's a treatment. good example where if you um, started with the wrong animal, mm -hmm. that you, you, you could increase the plant, whereas if you had the right animal, in this case goats, it could right. really make a difference. It's that window that you have to really yeah. focus on. Mm -hmm. So, yellow star thistle is an invasive that we deal a lot with, with in the Pacific Northwest. It's got that really terrible spiny head, oh, really I hard to graze. Yeah. So Karen actually did um, a study about that with looking at different stages of, of the plant and the different type of grazers that she could implement in right. it to control it. And this was just kind of above Lewiston, above the Snake River on kind of a gentle uh, slope at the top, right above a really steep country. And this, this plant really grows in some steep country, as you know. Yeah. So what she was looking at was not only the types of grazers, um, but also the plant response to grazing at its different phenological stages. So the rosette, the bolting, and the flowering Yeah, phage. so it's like rosette in the early spring, and then mm -hmm. bolting, it bolts in like end of May, and then uh, in June, July, and summer, we got that, rose that flowering, we got flowering stage. Yeah. Right, right. So in these treatments, um, I found that the reduction of yellow star thistle, um, the only real reduction was that it was a combination of of cattle and sheep or no actually so that that's what's frustrating is if you look at this graph the red graph bar is the control mm -hmm. and the only time we had any reduction less than the control red less than not grazing was by sheep in the fall sheep in this was july okay so the plant was in its full spiny yeah. yeah but that's it's really frustrating because we were trying to use targeted grazing to decrease yellow right. star thistle and you see that when we grazed it in the rosette and the bolt 
we increased. And you mentioned why that. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's another point you need to really focus on knowing your plants in your landscape is that that um, that kind of pressure that the grazers put onto that plant actually stimulates it to produce those lateral stems. So when you put that pressure, it, it answers back in a response of more possible seed heads. So you're really increasing um, your invasive yeah, yeah. by grazing it. Sometimes. And it goes back to what you said early on that targeted grazing is this mix of understanding the animal and the plant. In this case, it was really true. We, the plant had an influence and the animal did. So something that is not really talked about a lot is the importance of stocking rate and the frequency of grazing. Um, people manage for targeted grazing um, knowing the, how many animals to put on and when to take them off. That's a key, and not a lot of data has really been focused on these yeah, important factors. Yeah, you're right. They, you say they manage, and I think that's why. We haven't done a lot of studies on this. There's not very many studies, but it's really because it's the skill of the manager to knowing mm -hmm. when, and so it's hard to set up a, a replicated study right. where the animals go on for X number of days. That's where the art yeah. comes into that's it. Right. You can't, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So there's not much research on that, and that's because it really is an art. Yeah. So... Uh, timing, herbivore type, and intensity of grazing or defoliation are all the important factors of targeted grazing. And we're going to give you some examples here. We're going to start out with um, the continuum of some plants are easier than others to control. You have our typical cheatgrass, which is what we deal a lot with here, and kudzu, which is a um, East Asian um, invasive. Um, these are pretty easily to easy to control when you hit the right window. Cheatgrass is very palatable in the spring green up. Um, and then as you move along the spectrum, salt cedar and juniper are, are more difficult uh, things to control. And it's because of the secondary compounds that just don't agree with our grazers. It's, it's very yeah, hard to manage very that. very highly defended. It's really hard to get animals. There are some junipers, for example, that are not as bad as others, but salt cedar has a lot of salt in it. So uh -huh. yeah, so it's just important to realize that some plants are relatively easy and some are pretty hard. Right. So here we just have a little snapshot of what targeted grazing can do. And um, this was kudzu. Um, so it's a very vine-like, you know, pea family um, wraps around plants and everything like that. Um, so you see on the right was after grazing, and this was just one year after grazing, and this was from goats. Um, and an interesting point on this little study was that um, goats love the, the leafy spurge is, our, is very widespread. Um, it's pretty prominent west of the Mississippi. Um, you can see here that there is a ex enclosure and there's goats grazing in that almost all green area and you can just see the the depiction of, of what targeted grazing can do um, how successful goats and sheep can be utilized at that and what's really great about spurge is that it's a considered a really good forage it's in the euphorbia family which is the poinsettia family so it has that latexy sappy um, compound in it which is actually really really good for for sheep and goats as far as um weight gain. High in energy, yeah. they actually did a study where they had a um they put growing lambs on either uh leafy spurge or native plants and when they took them off they expected native plants to yield a higher weight of lambs but it's actually the leafy spurge that produced yeah, that's heavier kind of lambs interesting. yeah and that wasn't done in montana yeah mm -hmm. so and what's also interesting is that some cattle producers because um cattle that secondary compound does not agree with them and actually makes them sick. So cattle producers will employ sheep uh, producers to come and graze their fields so that they can utilize that grass that's underneath. Yeah, they form little cooperatives and even do that. Yep. So this was a study actually done in the 50s in Canada where they were using planted wheat grass amongst uh, spurge stands to see if they could suppress um, the spurge growth. And it actually significantly did. And then they figured out, well, let's see what happens if we introduce sheep at the same time. And as you can see, that introduction of, of sheep really suppressed that leafy spurge recruitment even more. So it was kind of a marriage of not necessarily biocontrol, but just a competition of a native plant and giving it an upper hand with that sheep grazing as well. Yeah, I often point out that this this study was done in the 50s, and it's sad because we didn't start having really big problems with leafy spurge in the West until the 80s. Right. And so we actually knew the answer in the 50s, and somehow we missed it. Of course, a lot of people point out that <clears throat> we have a lot less sheep. Right. Excuse me, we have a lot less sheep now than we used to have. Yep. So that could be part of the problem with leafy spurge. 
So we just wanted to go through just some picture by picture um, examples of what sheep grazing could do um, with leafy spurge. So this is in 2002 in Deer Lodge Valley, a lot of yellow here. And, and, and this picture was taken the next day, They un or even maybe later that afternoon, they uh, unloaded the sheep and started grazing sheep in that, but from the this Deer Lodge uh, Coordinated Weed Management mm -hmm. Group. So year later, a, oh, yeah, year later, a lot of less yellow. And again, see. this is be, this is the effect from last year. This is before they let the sheep graze, but mm -hmm. big difference. Yeah. And we're actually here. We're seeing a lot of our little native plants coming back. We've got some sagebrush in the foreground and in the background, and you're seeing just barely a little bit of yellow along that creek area. Yeah. So those native plants were always there, but when this the competition from the leafy spurge went away, they they started growing up. Mm -hmm. And this is the, pre the following year, and lots, a lot of more healthy um, sage stand in the background there. You can see. Right, a lot of times, uh, one of the reasons we use um, herbs, uh, the one, one of the reasons we use livestock around these little streams like this is because there's not very many herbicides that are available mm -hmm. for use along streams. A few, but not many. So here's just a good before and after picture of just what targeted grazing can do, and. Four years, I mean, that's that's incredible for a great Yeah, thing. it was a very successful project, no doubt about it. So now we're going to show you another example. Um, I like this picture because not only can you see the, the significant decrease of before and after, but your 2003, that is a very established leafy spurge stand. You've got new growth growing up between the dead standing material of that leafy spurge from previous years. And as we can see on the right, um, not only is there a reduction, um, this was a rail to trail project actually. You could see that your big rye grass is also coming back too. Yeah, I mean, we still got leafy spurge, but that rye is starting to come through. And that's just increasing that competition. You're giving your natives, like I said, a, a just a leg up, like an, mm -hmm. an upper hand on, on the competition. You bet, and that was this was goat grazing. So our study on star thistle, um, where we didn't really have much success in it, we did find out that uh, star thistle is actually a, a good forage at, at certain times, but the introduction of goat grazing really um, impacted that. And this is goes into the importance of um, finding the right the right grazer. Goats right, have a yeah. very leathery mouth, and those really really violent looking spikes on the star thistle, they actually degrade with the saliva of goats. So they had no trouble with, with grazing it. Yeah. So all. we did that study up in Lewiston and mm -hmm. we found out that neither sheep nor cattle were very successful. And I was ready to give up grazing <laughs> on that stuff. And then I met this man, Ray Holes, and he had a, he has a company called Prescriptive uh, Services, Prescri Prescriptive Grazing, grazing Services. Services. Yeah. And he said, just what you said, he said, oh, the goats, they can handle it. I mm -hmm. was very skeptical. But you'll see these goats chomping through this yellow star thistle. So that's the first day we put them out. Gosh. And they're just chomping away. They, they got their lips all over it. So, so Ray was right. But the data speaks even stronger. And as you can see through these plots, um, if you're familiar with topographs, these are very, very close together um, study, study sites, which actually correlates to pretty steep, really steep, really, really, really steep country. So I nearly died several times <laughs> on this study. It's very steep. Oh, you saw probably from some of those pictures. Oh, yeah. Too. yeah. Yeah. So obviously cattle grazing probably wouldn't work here, but goats, you know, incline doesn't really seem to phase them very much. So. Right. No, they were fine. And I guess the other thing I'll point out is uh, that this is a really large study. This was well over a thousand acres and a thousand uh, animals when we first started. So this was a real landscape. Each of those dots on there was where we set up a grazed or ungrazed plot. Mm -hmm. And here's what one of those grazed plots looked like. So we can see through the density of the canopy that um, your yellow star thistle significantly decreased. And what I found really interesting from this was that there was a, a flea beetle biocontrol also introduced. It was kind of the marriage of the, of the targeted grazing controls, which I love to see. Um, the sheep come in, or the go I'm sorry, the goats come in, and they significantly decrease that yellow star thistle density, so that those flea beetles could come in and really do their job better and target those last remaining, um, those plants. It seems like it concentrated the insects on what remaining plants there were. Mm -hmm. it, we ne there's still a yellow star thistle up there, but I think it's in much better control than it was. Great. So something that we kind of like to keep looking at when we're targeted grazing is what other responses to plant communities that we're inflicting on. So in this case with the yellow star thistle, um, 
not only were the seed heads um, decreased when grazed and the plants per plot were decreased, but we also were looking at different vegetation of your grasses and forbs. And some a problem usually is, is that when you're targeted grazing, your native plants get utilized as well. In this case, when that overstory of star thistle was reduced, your grasses and your forbs that were still grazed actually came back stronger. And yeah, know, no, that's right. Densely. So we were able to suppress the yellow star thistle, but give again, shift the advantage to the grasses in this case. Right. So there's a lot of benefits of targeted grazing. Um, as you see, have you, have you seen by those pictures, it can be highly effective um, and significantly improves the pasture quality. Um, it definitely tries to steer away from the kind of the dangerous monocropping that that invasives kind of inflict on on landscapes. Um, it is the only eco-friendly form of of control. You're not spraying pesticides or herbicides. Um, grazing on landscape is a, a natural natural process. Yeah, the when other, managed the other correctly. real environmentally, depending on how you look at it, would be a biocontrol with insects. It comes mm -hmm. out and it's very sustainable. But yeah, when we start talking about herbicides or spraying or plowing up, that that doesn't look very good. No, often. no. Um, there are effects on your your, your non-targeted species, so that's something that um, you need to pay attention to. Um, the great thing about that is you convert this, you know, kind of nuisance into a saleable product. Um, I was actually talking to my sheep rancher that I worked for that, you know, if he slapped a, another sticker that said uh, hmm. improving wildlife habitat through my sheep, I'm sure that, you know, that would be a selling point on his on his lamb. Yeah. Um, it's also a more sustainable way of controlling your 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 invasives. Yeah, um, right. Because those those Although it does cost a lot of money, at least the money that comes in from those sheep can help sustain it over years. Sure. Yeah. And also, like we saw in the, the Star Thistle uh, study, it's more feasible in that rough terrain. You're not going to have a backpack sprayer on those those steep slopes that goats can just go up without blinking an eye, essentially. Right, yeah. And so goats and sheep are really good in rough terrain. Of course, cattle are not as good, and there's an also a place for cattle grazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least if you got rough terrain, then you have an option. Yeah. Besides spraying from the air, exactly. that's about your only other option. Exactly. So there are costs of targeted grazing. Um, you, since you are out in the open, there is cost of, of animal loss, and this can be from predators or, you know, them wandering and finding a fairly noxious plant that you're not aware of. Um, without fencing, you know, wandering is, is a problem. Um, there's the added, added expense of herders, trailers, you know, supplies, um, and water. That's uh, really important. I was fortunate enough to have a stock water pipeline system at the trailhead that I was grazing at. But that's a that's a concern that you have to take into consideration. You know, yeah, that. interesting thing is that since a lot of these targeted grazing projects are right in the interface between mm -hmm. the, you know, the Erdman interface, they, they actually, some of these producers have a big problem with people, with sheep just getting stolen. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. We've had, a, we've had a problem with them letting the horse go. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Yeah. So, that. yeah. But the, uh, yeah, and that's another thing. You can't really hang them up in the barn. They have to be fed all the time. So that's another um, consideration when you're targeted grazing in the long term. Um, the right. sheep, if you want to do it as an enterprise, that's right. the problem. The sheep need to eat every day. They need to eat every day. So in my case, these sheep were contracted out. They did have a home range um, that they could go back to, but that's not only always the case with everybody else. A decrease in animal production is also kind of a concern. They're hiking around all the time. They might not have the best forage, so that's something that producers right, need yeah, to be we, concerned about. Right, yeah, we gave about. some examples where weeds are good forage. There's right. a lot of examples where animals are getting rid of some really dense or, or, or overgrown areas where it's not very good forage. Right. So targeted grazing, it takes time. It's a several-year commitment. There's no single-year, single treatment um, application. You know, um, the first-year study actually might create more disturbance as we know the invasives love disturbances so um, you can actually see an increase in your first year um, that's where you don't want to get dis discouraged because um, once you reach that maintenance level you can actually su like significantly um, decrease your animal number and your time that you're up there i like to use the example of the sheep um, range that I worked on. This has been a 10-year study, and it's been they started out putting sheep on there for three months. We're now down to three weeks, so you can see a significant decrease in the maintenance of those. Yes, yeah, the, there animals. will always the sheep will need to always come back, but mm -hmm. for just a little while just to maintain it. So that's you got to have a longer long-term view. 
So when we're looking at land, uh, land planning and management for, for weeds, um, there's usually four main uh, tools that we can, we can use. Um, first, we can spray with, with chemicals and herbicides that, that might need to happen, you know. Um, biocontrols with uh, certain insects. There's that insect that attacks the seed head of the knapweed and the root was actually the natural predator of knapweed um, well, back in its home country. In now. its home country, yeah. And then we can have cultural, which are um, natural, naturally occurring things such as fire and grazing, but they're managed by, with a human impact. Now that's a good that. point. A lot of people think of goats and sheep as being biocontrol. They're not classical biocontrol. They're they're just cultural control. Mm -hmm. Something that always existed, herbivory, but now we're really putting it under control. Right, right. And then the actual physical going up, either you know drill drill seeding or physically pulling up the plant uh, for mechanical weed control. So here is the website. Um, I think it's your, it's your website. Yeah, it's the, yeah. the Targeted Grazing Committee of the Society for Range Management. We maintain the site, targetedgrazing.wordpress.com. We have some really important resources there, including kind of the beginning of targeted grazing, at least as a term, mm -hmm. was with the creation of this handbook, which is about 10 years ago now. So you can click on that and, and download that. I see. So you said that you downloaded it. I downloaded yeah. it about two years ago, and yeah. I read it before I even had a meeting with you. Yeah, and you can <laughs> um, also uh, you can also request a copy of that if you go to that website and then also another project that we did we just because there's not enough you can't do enough studies to do this we just started calling people and asking them what what did they think a prescription is what kind of animal when would they graze it so if you want a prescription to know when to graze what uh, there's a handbook on that and so this is our targeted grazing and like I want to wrap up it de it depends on your skills and your knowledge that's where the art form comes in it's really about building your observation and your knowledge about even just how your own flock works. Um, sometimes that can be an advantage, um, but it's definitely something that is acquired over time. Yeah, exactly right. This is not a have goat will travel. This yeah. is I've got the skill. I've got the animals. Yeah. I know my animals. Yeah. So anyway, I think the future of targeted grazing is great. And thanks so much for doing this today, Mikey. You yeah. learned a lot. No problem. Thank you. Hi, this is Karen Launchbaugh at the University of Idaho, and we're here again today to talk about integrated rangeland management. But now we're moving into a really interesting topic about how we might use animals in targeted grazing. And I'm here today with Mikey McDonnell, and um, I am an under or a, sorry graduate yeah, student, already a grad student, <laughs> already a grad student for the uh, Natural Resources Program. Um, I've had quite a bit of interest in targeted grazing for a number of years now, and I was fortunate enough to be a conservation writer in Missoula, Montana for an important elk winter range uh, habitat. So. so Mike is going to tell us a little bit about her experience and what she knows about targeted grazing.